I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Mikhail Bertsev, the Scientific Director of the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute at ARI, and a head of neural networks and deep learning laboratory at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Mikhail is also the founder and leader of the open source conversational AI framework Deep Pavlov and has a PhD in computer science from the Keldish Institute of Applied Mathematics, as well as an MA in microelectronics from the Moscow Power Engineering Institute. He joins us today to discuss trends in natural language processing, artificial intelligence, and complex systems. So Mikhail, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me start out by asking about your background. Computer science is a big field. There are a lot of specializations. What inspired you towards a career in artificial intelligence? You know, the biggest inspiration for me was a love for science because for me, science has a universal value for humanity actually. And uh, it helps us as society to evolve and improve on a global scale. And so I decided that uh, it's cool to make science and to participate in scientific pro pro process. But on the other hand, it's much better if you will be able to discover or to improve scientific process itself. So, and if learning and gaining new knowledge is a like basic activity in science. And so my idea was that I need to start a basic foundational principles of gaining new knowledge of learning and simulating it and proposing new approaches for knowledge discovery. So this is why I decided that artificial intelligence is like a first step for improving our ability as humanity to produce better science. So this mm. is maybe strange, strange like um, reasoning, but it's so it's AI for me, it's just studying principles of learning to apply them to improve scientific progress. Okay, okay. Well, now on your website, and I, I should preface this by saying, I will put links to all of your websites and, and research projects you know, in the interview notes. Yeah, on your you. website, I noticed a lot of medical research applications, including things like cancer screenings. So I, I'm wondering, what are some of the most exciting examples of social issues where AI can make a positive difference? I think that uh, we will see a lot of such um, applications in medical science in the near future, because we have a lot of data and where you have a a lot of data you will be able to apply machine. But right now, I think that the most important uh, applications are related to, to um, pandemics or to how we can fight viruses. Because with uh, our models, we can train them to represent uh, DNA of viruses or uh, protein sequences of viruses and then predict uh, epitopes or parts of uh, viruses, which are um, sites for antibody binding. So we can predict actually uh, which antibody, which kind of antibodies we should create. So we can predict these uh, like stretches of uh, amino acid sequences for viruses, which can be binding sites and then synthesize antibodies against these um, sites. And we also can predict um, utility of uh, these sites as well, because we need to, to produce antibodies uh, for the parts of the virus which are not highly mutable, because then the virus can escape our antibody if, we, if antibody binds to highly mutable region. So this will accelerate new vaccine, uh, vaccines creation of new vaccines pretty much, I think. Mm. And on the other hand, we can apply the same technology for uh, onco-immunology. So we can fight cancers by uh, creating uh, antibody delivery um, agents to specific cells. So we can 
uh, as well if we have amylase sequences for specific uh, cell types, cancer cell types, then we can analyze them and to find regions of these specific um, proteins which can be used to identify cancerous cells and fight them. Okay, so, and, and you've touched on a lot. In fact, when you get into viruses and protein folding and things like that, sir, that could be an entirely separate interview. And in fact, I, I may come back to you for that at some point in the future. But in the case of medicine, do you think artificial general intelligence is, is useful? Um, or is the focus on creating better expert systems that basically memorize a body of known information and apply it for specialized applications? I think that uh, right now we have both approaches. So we have some research groups which are focused more on general systems. So they try to create like maybe multitask systems which are more universal. But on the other hand, we need to solve problems right now. So I think that in a few years, like maybe tens of years, we will have both of these threads of research. The first one is creating more AGI-like systems. But on the other hand, we will have more and more, um, more and more, um, systems with a high quality for solving practical uh, medical uh, applications. And uh, I don't know, actually, maybe at some point we will uh, accumulate so many specialized systems that they as a whole, they will join together to uh, create something like AGI. So it's just another, maybe it's just another role towards more and more capable AI systems. Oh. But, right, but right now, I think that uh, more practical approach is to build uh, solving one problem uh, after another. Yeah, yeah, no, that that does make sense. Yeah, and the idea of having these expert systems and then maybe at some future point developing a control mechanism based on AGI that is exciting. Well, if it's okay, let me ask for for this kind of problem solving, how is AI more useful? than traditional software approaches. Are there key benefits to it, such as maybe flexibility in problem solving that make it more useful? Yeah, you know, um, machine learning and current AI systems, they are um, totally different compared to traditional approaches because uh, in um, before we have started to use these uh, machine learning uh, approaches, we need to understand and to create program how to um, solve the problem. So we need to know solution before we create a system. And uh, this is actually not easy task. So, so you need to know how to solve the system, uh, to solve the problem if you want to automate your uh, like solution. But machine learning on the other hand is just like totally different because here you should have no knowledge beforehand how to solve the problem. You can only have examples of correct solutions and you can train system by itself to solve the problem for you. So you see that you have, uh, you should not have understanding how to solve the problem from the beginning here because the system can solve it Certainly, you need some, uh, it, it, it produces a problem that you need to verify solution. This is why, for example, if we are talking about medicine and we have some uh, AI which screens uh, radiology and so on, it just finds some suspicious uh, images and send them to the doctor. And doctor decides if it's case of uh, like some pathology or not. But on the other hand, AI allows to screen much more people and make all these uh, modern medicine much more affordable for everyone. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so to, to take a step away from medicine for a moment, AI has applications across virtually every industry and specialization out there. I did wanna ask briefly about financial systems. 
I, I just kind of picked one out of a hat. This one popped into my mind though. Would AI be useful for tasks like Forex or cryptocurrency trading or predicting the stock market? And, and the reason I wanted to ask that was, it seems to me like if you could train AI systems to be able to predict those things, it might also create some ethical issues with having an unfair advantage of companies using it as compared to the average trader in whatever those markets are. Um, yes, I think that uh, so. Um, uh, if uh, actually, I'm not an expert in financial markets or systems, but uh, from the general uh, point of view, if these time series are predictable in principle, then we can try to apply these machine learning uh, tools to predict them. And if uh, they are predictable, maybe new tools like deep neural networks uh, would work better than previous one like SVMs or some autoregressive models like what we used before this. And uh, I don't know. And maybe people are already applying these uh, techniques to forecast. And also, on the other hand, uh, we have this algo trading today which is like high, high frequency trading. And uh, this already uh, like produces advantage for companies which optimize for hardware infrastructure for high frequency trading. And uh, is it fair or not? So I, I, I think that we as a society should decide what we should allow and what we should not allow here. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's an excellent point. I, I think that there are lots of big questions that come out of this. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be able to talk to you today, because it, it, we're entering this entire new uncharted territory, I guess, of technological, human, and also ethical questions, I think. Um, yes. So from your website, it appears that your team at Aerie is very focused on intense, mathematically oriented code level AI. Uh, you also lead the Deep Pavlov team, which is more focused on conversational natural language processing AI. So I'm wondering, could you tell me a little bit about the difference between these two projects? Yes, uh, th these are two parts uh, of my interests in AI. The first part is uh, trying to dig out more fundamental principles, how we can train our system to gain new knowledge out of uh, surrounding world. And this is why in, in ARI, we are focusing on more like uh, hard stuff, creating new approaches for longer sequences and uh, new neural architectures. But uh, I also want to make an impact on everyday life to improve our everyday life. And this is uh, why uh, my uh, lab at MIPT, where we are focused on conversational AI, on uh, uh, virtual assistance technology, because I think that uh, these virtual assistants, they will be our future very soon. Uh, and uh, this will have a very disruptive effect on many, many sides of our, how we communicate with uh, other so digital services, uh, how we gain new information, and so on and so on. And I want to contribute to, to, to this and to this by creating technology and uh, to make it happen faster. Yeah. Well, and again, I would urge the audience who's watching this, and I will put links in, I would urge them to visit both of your sites. The, the amount and the depth of work that your team is producing is incredible it, it is it is you know i'm simply amazed and it is this is deep code level work so you guys are in it right where it needs to be created at now in terms of the natural language processing aspect of things i did want to touch briefly on google lambda and i'll probably mention that a few times this obviously this is not one of your projects but but you have specialization in this area so Lambda, as, as many people know, has recently been in the news when Blake, 
when researcher Blake Lemoyne posted transcripts of conversations that led him to believe the program had become sentient. So I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Do you think that Google Lambda is sentient or, or is it just very well trained, I guess? I, I think that uh, uh, here we see a curious pattern. Uh, uh, I even think that we should call it Eliza moment. Uh, when maybe you know the history of uh, AI and the history of uh, AI at the, at the very beginning, uh, Raisin Bach, uh, he created a system which he, he called ELISA, and it was uh, just a bunch of uh, different rules. And one of these rules was that uh, the system should uh, like repeat some parts of uh, the user phrase, and uh, which made it. Uh, very human-like, uh, and after uh, Weights and Bounds uh, secretary chatted with the system for some time, she asked him to leave the room because uh, she wanted, she said that uh, th there are some private exchange. And I think that uh, this is uh, how we can be fooled by some systems which looks like very human. And here with uh, this uh, case, uh, with recent, this recent case, certainly we have much more advanced uh, chatbot, which is trained on huge amount of data, totally different uh, principle of operating, but still it's just system which produces very probable responses, but it has no agency. Moreover, it was at the beginning, it was primed as a like artificial agent, friendly, and which should help uh, people. And then all the all this dialogue is just continuation and playing this role. Because if you uh, prompt this system with description that you are Shakespeare or you are a Newton, it will try to continue uh, as it pretending that it, it, the system is uh, Shakespeare or Newton or stuff like that. So, and uh, sometimes it, you, you can be so, and if you are working on these systems, you're constantly thinking about them and trying to find if they are sentient or not, you might be uh, say fooled that they, they really are. Yeah, well, and, and you have, again, one of the reasons that I wanted to ask you was you have a unique level of knowledge about this. In addition to working on the deep Pavlov framework, you've also organized a series of academic conversational AI challenges in the past, including NIPS 2017, NUR IPS in 2018, EMNLP in 2020, and then NUR IPS again in 2021. So you, you have a lot of experience in natural language processing and conversational AI. Um, so it, one thing I also wanted to touch on was the Google Lambda system, even if it's not sentient, and I think that the, I, I think opinions seem to be coming down on the side that it's not. This is run on very expensive, custom-built, neural network hardware. I, If I understand correctly, they had a million node network with billions of different weights. Now that's something for these conversational assistants that's way beyond the reach of most organizations and people. What kind of hardware is your team focused on designing for? And how do those hardware constraints influence the software? Yes, that's a very important problem. Uh, the, how uh, research in academia and uh, in industry, uh, how they are different from each other. Because all this competition, this was attempt for uh, to make uh, academia, uh, to give academia access to real users, to volunteers, and to share knowledge between different teams to make them more competitive uh, compared to industrial uh, labs because in industrial labs, you have much more hardware. And also, uh, which is important, you have access to uh, much more information to train your systems. 
And uh, I, I think that we still have not solved this problem. So usually what we have, we have a very large model and there are attempts to create these models uh, and to publish them open source because initial models like GPT-3 or uh, these uh, Lambda uh, model by Google, they are not published. So you can uh, query them uh, uh, via some API, but you cannot use them uh, for, your, for your own purposes. But there are uh, startups as well as there are uh, there is a big science project in uh, hugging face community then they are uh, training large models for community to use so it's like a, um, we have now community can uh, is trying to catch up uh, these uh, big industrial labs and uh, i hope that it will succeed even if uh, these large models they will not be directly usable for small labs, still we can use technique which is called distillation when we take large model uh, pre-trained on a big amount of data and then convert it to a much smaller model which can be used in practical applications and, and in research in smaller labs. So I think that uh, right now we are looking for solutions so we have not we were not very successful with uh, competitions, but now we are doing this uh, as an uh, academic society, as a, co a research community with the startups like Hugging Face. And uh, I think we hope that we will catch up and we will have some good uh, progress in this public space. Absolutely. And, and what you're doing, I think there, there should be a differentiation there. I think with the Google Lambda and other projects like that, these industrial scale projects, really the, the, the question they're asking is, can it be done? And the question that what you're working on, because it's open source conversational frameworks, it's can anyone do it? You know, And that's yes. very similar to my mind. That's very similar to the Linux operating system or 3D printing, where it's something that has empowered millions of people around the world. And so it's not something that only a small group of people are learning and benefiting from. Then basically you're taking many of these ideas and distributing them to all of mankind, humankind, which I think is very valuable. Um, now, I, I did want to ask about the Turing test. This is the benchmark for artificial intelligence. And in its original form, the, the, the rough idea was that if a chatbot could convince a human that it was more human than another person on chat, then it passed the test. I know there, there are many variations on the Turing test, but does today's AI software render the Turing test obsolete or would it simply mean that by 20th century standards, we've achieved true AI? First of all, I think that uh, this uh, event uh, at Google with Lambda model shows that we already, in some sense, passed Turing test. Because even in conditions where the human user has knowledge that it has chat with the artificial system, it still thinks that this system is like human level uh, intelligence, which is much harder in some sense than uh, Turing test. But uh, I don't think that uh, um, we still obtain human level intelligence because uh, uh, I think that maybe we, um, we, we are not deeply understand uh, idea of Turing. Actually, it was, uh, I think it was yesterday uh, uh, when it, it was his birthday, maybe Turing, Turing's birthday. And uh, actually, uh, I think that his idea was that uh, if we have a human user as a judge who, uh, who is trying to differentiate so it gives special tasks. It's, it, it's not just open domain conversation. It's testing. It's testing inte intellectual capabilities. And I think that in, in this case, uh, uh, we have a lot of benchmarks, a lot of tests 
for our natural language processing for our chatbot systems. And uh, for many of these tests, humans are still much better than uh, these AI systems. For some tests, uh, these systems already overcome human abilities, but for many other tests, they are still not as good as human. And they are not uh, as universal as universal as human are on these tests. Yeah, well, and, and you know, but I, I did have a couple of questions. And again, I'm getting a little bit more general in my questions, and I hope that's okay. But, um, you know, I, I before we close things up, I did have a couple of general ones. Now, Ray Kurzweil, the, the futurist, predicted that 2029 would be the year when AI would pass a valid Turing test. And I think he's speaking consistently, and if I recall correctly, he was benchmarking that with a thousand dollar computer or the, the year 2000 equivalent of it when he wrote the book. So he was, I think he was speaking about average machines, right? And, and everyday software. He, he said that 2029 would be the date basically when it would achieve human levels of intelligence. Do you think we're on track for Kurzweil's predicted schedule? I'm not sure. Uh, because I think that uh, over these years, uh, we will have much better systems, which has, like, uh, when you are judge another human being as uh, intelligent, usually you take into account common sense knowledge. So if uh, this other person has this common sense knowledge, and the problem for current systems is that they have uh, some domain knowledge, domain specific knowledge, but not common sense knowledge, which, which is general knowledge. And I hope that uh, what we are doing at Deep Power, so like what, what, what we want to do, we want to create something like, we started with a conversational AI, which is just natural language interface. But now we understand that we need not only this interface, but the whole infrastructure layer for intellectual, like virtual AI assistance. Uh, so we need to create a technology to empower a community to build more these uh, kind, more and more of these agents, and then I think that we will get gradual improvements. So we will get more and more capable uh, systems with more and more common sense. So I think that uh, your virtual assistant in five years will be much more knowledgeable than it is today. But still, I'm not sure that like in five or in 10 years, we will uh, reach the uh, human level of uh, like everyday knowledge. But yeah. uh, still, this technology will be very useful. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, and those are, those are difficult questions. And I'm not sure if there are any right or wrong answers there. I think we're all just guessing. But um, now I, I did, again, I wanted to touch on Kurzweil's other prediction. He predicted the technological singularity would arrive by 2045. Um, and, and that, again, that's supposedly an event where self-improving AI will lead to a new form of super intelligent, sentient AI. Do you, where do you fall in the singularity hypothesis? And do you expect to see that by 2045? Uh, basically, I like the idea and uh, it's, it's very captivating because uh, you, here you have something like, uh, because it gives you a sense that you are living in some exceptional uh, period of time when everything will change uh, during your lifetime. It's, it's a great idea and uh, by itself it's, it's, it's very appealing. But on the other hand, I have uh, like two uh, answers, two, two parts in my answer to your question. The first one, maybe, uh, uh, have you heard about uh, Doomsday in November 13, 2026? No, no, I haven't heard about that. Can you uh, tell me about uh, that? Yeah, sure, because in, it was in 1960 in Science Magazine, uh, an article was published by von Furster, uh, who was a cybernetician, uh, systems scientist. And he, with his colleagues, they took all the population data which they have and try, tried to fit some mathematical function to all the available data. And what they have found that uh, they can fit all the data 
with a hyperbolic function. And uh, this uh, hyperbolic function grows faster than exponential. And if exponential goes to infinity in infinite time, then hyperbolic law, it goes to infinity in infinite time. And if you have data points and you can calculate the best fit of your uh, function to these data points, so then they uh, fitted it to the data points, they found that this uh, hyperbolic function goes to infinity at November 13, 2026. So uh, I think that here we have some similarity with the, this uh, singularity idea. Uh, at some date, we will reach this singular point. And actually, uh, we, uh, in the 60s, there was uh, some uh, demographic processes which makes this uh, uh, like acceleration slower for more and more people on Earth. And now we see that we are uh, going to some fixed value in, uh, in, I don't know, 100 years or so. And uh, this is what I think about a concrete day. But uh, there is another part of this singularity idea that we need super intelligence. And it's very interesting question if uh, these uh, super intelligence can we obtain it or not? Because uh, what we have now, we have human, we can see human level intelligence, but we have never seen uh, superhuman intelligence. intelligence. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that we can build it in this way. So it, it, it will be case super, maybe we can, but maybe we can't. And it, it's very interesting. Actually, it, it would be great to create something like this uh, in controlled manner. Uh, I mean that uh, we need, to, as, as any powerful technology, we need to uh, have some checks on it and uh, to control it. So I don't know, can, can we create any other kind of uh, intelligence than human intelligence? And uh, if it will be much uh, like more intelligent than we are. Yeah. Those are interesting it, questions. It, it's still an open question, I think. Yeah. Well, Mikhail, that is a wonderful note to close on. Let me thank you again for your time today. Um, let me close by asking, what comes next for you, your research, and your team? Where can we expect to see you in tomorrow's headlines? I think uh, that, as I've said, I have two paths. And on the one path, I would like, and I think that we are already working uh, on applying uh, models which can process much longer sequences than current models can process, and applying these mo models to uh, bioinformatics. So training uh, larger and larger, say, if we have language models like Lambda for language, we can train the model, DNA model for DNA sequences. And yesterday we have published one of these models uh, on GitHub and on Hugging Face. And uh, we invite every bioinformatician, every genetist to, to, to take our models and to experiment with them. And we have like plans for much power, more powerful models in pipeline. And on the other hand, I expect to continue to contribute to development of uh, this infrastructure layer for virtual assistants. And here we also have a lot of interesting stuff uh, in our lab right now, and which should be published later this year. Wonderful. Mikhail, thank you again, sir. Thank you so thank much. You for, thank you, sir, for inviting me. It was a pleasure to, to be here. <laughs>